Hello everyone, welcome to another session for our MCQ series. For today's topic, I've chosen on plantation crops. Uh, my name is Hansa Nora Sama and I've done my bachelor's in horticulture and I've also completed my master's in nematology and agriculture. Right, please don't forget to subscribe and please press the bell icon and please don't forget to like the video if you've liked the session as well as share with your friends. Right, first and foremost, we need to understand what an a plantation crop is a plantation crop is nothing but a group of commercial crops of a perennial nature which is cultivated extensively in tropical as well as subtropical uh, situations or climatic conditions and which need an employment of labor uh, throughout the year and they produce of which are usually consumed after processing and as you can see some of the uh, plantation crops I've given out here so we have different categories so it's very important to know to differentiate between which are the uh, horticulture crops which are the um, the plantation crops the cash crops because uh, in, in the exams any they might ask you guys any questions regarding the basis of classification of all these crops so to make it more easy I've made this table for you all so as you can see here for the oil yielding crops it's coconut uh, palm oil and palmyra uh, masticatory we have erica nut we have a uh, beetle nine and for beverage we have tea coffee cocoa nut crops we have cashew nut and industrial crops we have rubber so these are the major plantation crops to make it more easier i've differentiate uh, i've given a differentiation between uh, this plantation crop as well as the uh, fruit crops, right? So the climate under which it's cultivated, it's uh, in the tropical, which is mainly on a uh, 20 degree north and 20 degree south latitude. But for fruit crops, we have in the tropics, we have on subtropicals as well as temperate. So the ranges are more, whereas in plantation, it's mostly grown in the tropical or subtropical uh, region, right? And for necessity of training and pruning, this is a very intercul uh, important intercultural operations. So for plantation crops, we need lesser training and pruning, but for uh, fruit crops, we need more training and pruning. Okay, so for the suitability for consumption, uh, it's usually processed and consumed. Major portion is consumed directly in fresh form, right? So here the fruit can be consumed without processing. We, uh, we can either go for process as well as we can uh, consume it directly but whereas for this plantation crops the post harvest technology and the processing has to be perfect for plantation crops as you cannot directly consume the uh, product right and for perishability of the produce it is less it is not per perishable whereas for food crops these are more perishable and the export potential or the foreign exchange earnings it's plantation crops are comparatively higher than the fruit crops right and the uses it is diversified for example it can be used in medicines as beverages as oil seeds or as in industries for clothes for rubbers right so plantation crops has more diverse uh, uses than the fruit crops because for fruit crops it's we mostly use it for consumption only whereas for plantation crops we can use it for several other uh, uses all right so our first question here is on rubber all right so the rubber is native to which of the following a north america b india c brazil d china and e congo right so the right answer for this is brazil as uh, rubber it originated or it's native to brazil all right so here in this slide i've given you all uh, some of the uh, origins and some important points on plantation crops roughly so the topographical situation of the plantation crops they are as you can see uh, the plant plantation crops are mostly grown in the tropical subtropical areas or mostly they need a humid region to grow right so in india it's mostly majority of it is found in south india as well as in the northeastern states right and the south indian uh, states we have in mainly in kerala all right karnataka and tamil nadu right so these are the three main states in south india where they grow a plant uh, these uh, plantation crops in a large scale right in, or in a commercial scale so basically even for uh, in india uh, kerala they account for about more than 90 percent of the production for rubber another question can come up from here as well suppose if anyone asks which is the highest producing uh, rubber india is also the fourth largest producer 
of rubber. Um, okay, so the commercialization of plantation, right? So coconut and areca nut, they have been cultivated in India and for cocoa in 1960s, uh, it has its it is of Brazilian origin, right? But it only gained the expansion after the 1970s. Whereas oil palm is of African origin and they have the highest edible oil yielding crop. For uh, suppose they could yield about four to six ton oil per hectare and sometimes even it can be more than the eight or nine tons per hectare, right? So for cashew, the origin is from Portuguese during the 16th century in the Malabar coast, okay? So it was first introduced as uh, by the Portuguese as a soil conservation crop, right? It was first introduced in India as a soil conservation crop by the Portuguese in the 16th century. And uh, rubber here, it is of Brazilian origin, all right? And that's why even its scientific name or the botanical name is Javier Brasiliensis. So it is a species of rubber wood which is native rainforest in the region of South America, including Brazil, Venezuela, Equator, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. Okay, so this crop was introduced to South Asia uh, through the Kew Garden in the UK in the late 1970s, and now it's grown in uh, everywhere in the tropical regions of Asia, Africa as well as America so this is something about um, rubber okay so here in this picture I've given a picture of one process of controlled building from where they would cut a uh, thin slice in the bark and get the latex okay so if you know the term if you know what this process is called please drop in the comment section all right so usually it's done when the when the plant or the tree they grow uh, or attain the stage of about seven years old. Moving to the second question, uh, the question says, consider the following statement on Arabica coffee and state which of the following is not true. All right, so A, number one says Arabica coffee is grown in an elevation of between 500 to 1000 meter. Second one says it's, it needs a temperature requirements of 12 to 15, sorry, 15 to 25 degrees Celsius and three, Leaf rust is a serious disease of coffee, right? So the right answer for this is number D as Arabica coffee is, uh, this statement is completely wrong as Arabica coffee is grown in an elevation of more than uh, 1500 meter. It's not 500 to 1000 meter. So here I've uh, given uh, a rough important points on coffee there are a few types of coffee but then the main ones are arabica coffee as well as robusta coffee so this coffee arabica is an arabica coffee coffee cinephora is a robusta and coffee bangalensis it's a uh, wild tree coffee which is mostly found in the Myanmar region sumatra or in bengal as well okay so it is widely cultivated in india as well so the main origin for uh, this arabica coffee is in utopia there's a place called Kaffa in Utopia, and from this only the name coffee was originated, right? And this Robusta was found in, it originated or it's native to Central Africa, right? So main difference here is the uh, the Arabica, they, ha they are grown in the higher elevations, right? Say about 1,000 to 1,500 meter, whereas Robusta, it is grown in the lower elevation, say uh, from about 500 to 1,000 meter. So um, this Arabica was introduced to uh, India by a Muslim pilgrim. Uh, his name was Papa Budan from Okay, and then he brought this Arabica coffee from Yemen to India. All right, it was during the on uh, 1670. And for the Robusta, Robusta was introduced to India by the Indochina China region around the 19th century. Right. It was actually, this robusta was actually done uh, to plant in the estates of the lower elevation. So that's how uh, this robusta was introduced in India, right? So propagation, uh, coffee can be usually propagated in two ways, uh, whether it's maybe seed and vegetatively propagated as well. In vegetative propagation, we have uh, cuttings as well as we have grafting. So cut, uh, cuttings are mostly used for propagation of coffee. The cutting that we use is mostly for the semi-hardwood cutting. 
and usually done between the six month old plan another important point that uh, that they practice or that they do on coffee is this shading as you can see in this picture here they have grown uh, some trees in between this coffee uh, farm or a coffee orchard uh, it's in a hill slope it's in a contour way and they have grown other trees in between so, uh, how these trees or how would this shade act is that it will act as a natural canopy for the coffee tree, as well as it uh, it actually improves the aromatic uh, properties as well right it also helps in an elegant uh, more greenish glossy leaves so it gives a more of a attractive leaf to the coffee plant so not other than that it also improves the uh, organic material uh, organic matter as the leaves which has uh, the fallen leaves will be naturally decomposed in the soil and it will act it will act as a uh, organic matter okay so other than that uh, even for the real regulation, higher sunlight would give a higher food bearing capacity or maybe overbearing. So to stop that, uh, if you have a proper um, amount of shade and sunlight, then the overbearing can be stopped as well. So none other than that, it can also act as a windbreak. Other than this, it also gives an insulation effect, right? So these are some. These are the, some of the purposes of shading and shading regulation is accessory in co coffee and it has to be done every year just before the commencement of monsoon. So the season for this is mostly May, June, July monsoon by cutting looping of branches. It is because during the period it receives less sunlight. So in shading regulation when the trees they grow uh, out of control then we have to uh, train or prune the trees as well. right? So these are mostly done in the uh, month of May, June, July in the monsoon when the sunlight is lesser and they'll be requiring more sunlight during that time right so we have um, training as well we have two types of training system which is single system training and multiple uh, training system and um, in this single system what they do is that they just cut out the main branch and it is most commonly done in India the vertical or the main branch is usually cut off and the side branches are kept whereas in this multiple system these the main branch is usually bent down so that uh, it can restrict the growth of the uh, main stem all right so uh, pruning is another agricultural operation uh, in this the coffee by pruning an old productive wood is removed by encouraging the growth of the new branches all right so these new branches or growth would become uh, next year cropping wood and we have a light pruning we have a medium to CV pruning as well so here it's done after harvest usually from the from December to February but uh, whereas in CV pruning it's done once in four years right and stumping or cola pruning we have it's um, to rejuvenate the badly damaged bushes during the shade regulation or due to irregular pruning and um, the last one here says leaf spot and white stem borer they are an important disease and pest of coffee so usually for leaf spot arabica coffee is more susceptible there'll be a, a defoliation of the crop there'll be yellow spots and uh, the powdery orange color will start to form in the leaves as well and um, other than that even the twigs will become dead and they will become uh, more dried and black the whole plant will look like as if it's already dead right and the stem borer is also an important pest of coffee so it questions can come like uh, which of the following is an important disease or pest of coffee so these two are the main diseases and pests so if questions come you'll be able to answer on it right okay so here again like I've given some important because coffee uh, plantation crops as I said it's very important for its processing so don't do not forget as you're reading uh, about the three crops it won't take time just give it a one read and that's more than enough at least you'll be able to have an, a basic understanding and idea about it okay so let's just go on with the harvesting arabica coffee is usually harvested during November or January chances ch there there might be chances of asking for the harvesting as well right so robusta coffee from December to February all right so usually the uh, coffee crop is ready to harvest once it's uh, like about three to four years okay but then most eco economical yields can be obtained meaning that higher production can be obtained when they reach about five to twelve years right and they can be grown up till 50 years so harvest they harvest it when they turn red to deep crimson in color this is a harvest index or maturity index at what stage it should be harvested okay 
So harvesting is usually done in four stages, right? So first one is fly picking, main picking, stripping, and gleanings. So in fly picking, here the small scale picking of the ripe berries is done okay it's usually done from october to november whereas in this main picking we usually harvest the ripe uh, berries and it is done in december stripping when all the ripe berries are uh, already harvested we are left over with the overripe ones right so in stripping what we do is that we we take out all the leftover berries and in gleanings uh when when we've completed all the semi rives when we've picked all the rives and we've completed all uh, with all the over rives so we are left with the uh, fruits which have fallen on the ground. So these cleanings is nothing but collection of the fruit that has been dropped down during the harvesting. Right, so these are the main four stages of harvesting. And coffee, it can, it can be processed on two methods. The first one is wet method, second is dry method. In wet method, it is done for preparation of parchment or plantation coffee and the steps here are collection pulping demucilaging and washing drying hulling polishing sorting and bagging at the last so in dry method it's done to obtain a cherry coffee so ex uh, questions might come on uh, which method is used to prepare um, or to obtain a cherry coffee the steps here are the ha harvesting and after that, they'll be drying, bagging, roasting, and grinding. So these are some of the important points or highlights on coffee, right? Okay, so let's go to our third question. Which of the following is the most popular method of propagation of tea? Okay, so number A, budding, B, grafting, layering, D, cutting, E, none of the above. The right answer for this is cutting. And um, actually, all of these options are also a methods of propagation in uh, tea. But the most popular ones is cutting and uh, through seeds. The commercial method of propagation is through a single node semi-hardwood cutting. It is a preferred method. Okay, so what, uh, what we do here is that the elite clone or the best clone is taken and it it is taken or selected with a desirable characters like yield, uh, quality, quick recovery, etc. And these are used as cuttings, all right? So when is it done? These are the time in North India and Assam is done during the winter season with low rainfall, but the plenty of mist is desirable. So it'll be during October to November. Whereas in South India, it's done in the summer season, which is all the rainy season. Uh, so it's done in May and June, all right? So uh, there are different types are the methods of planting for tea as well. So we have two types with one is a single hedge system and then the second one is double hedge system. So what happens in a uh, single hedge? So it's the main difference is between the spacing only, right? So here uh, the spacing adopted is just 1.2 into 0.75 meter accommodating. Uh, 10,800 plants per hectare and double hedge system is like the double of the single hedge system so here what we do is that we grow uh, there are more multiple rows so it's about 1.35 into 0 0.75 into 0 0.75 and it accumulates about uh, accommodates about 13,200 plants per hectare right so these are the main two methods of planting for tea okay here teas are usually they are mainly two types of tea this is the sam tea and here this is china tea all right so this scientific name is just for Ch camellia sinensis varisamica and here for this camellia sinensis was sinensis right so the main difference is uh, these are more of a tree type and china tree a china tea is more of a bush type and the leaves are more rounded here but in Chinese tea, it's more of the oblong or maybe irregular, very small, slender, and serrated. Right, so um, this tea originated from, or the region of origination or native to the southeast China, Sichuan, Yunnan, to Assam, which is in India, and has been reported as the center of origin of the tea plant. All right, so these are the two origins of tea. And this tea is actually a calcifuge and uh, aluminum. Uh, accumulator so usually tea, tea can be grown in variety of soils but they they need more uh, more of a well-drained organic soil uh, organic high rich in organic matter as well as they grow well in the regions of uh, in the red soil right so that the red soil is present in the northeastern states so these 
And so here they see they need about more of iron as well as manganese. So these are the requirements of tea. And here I've given the types of pruning in tea. We have about one, two, three, four, five. Five types. And the first one is skiff, uh, skiffing. The second is tipping, lung or fringe pruning, medium pruning, and rehabilitation. So uh, this uh, skiffing is also the lightest pruning. And usually here what we do is that we just level off the uh, which is level of the leaves, right? And tipping. Uh, tipping is done in the first rounds of the harvesting of the young leaves, right? And Or maybe we can just say it's the first plucking of the leaves. And this lung pruning or this fringe pruning, it's done for the crisscross branches. Medium pruning is uh, usually done to check the uh, bush growth, whether it's growing uh, in an inconvenient height or whether it's proper. So medium pruning is done for that. And rehabilitation is the most severe and the deep or the deepest or the most severe pruning. It's mostly done to rejuvenate the bush which has been uh, completely uh, dead. So usually here what we do is that the bush is usually cut off the level right so these are the types of pruning and harvesting is uh, this is a very important uh, question for tea a lot of times questions have come on the harvesting the maturity index or the type how do you harvest the tea right so uh, it is done on young tender leaves removal of young shoots right remember and which are comprising an apical bud and two to three leaves right so uh, stress on this two to three leaves and an apical bud because these are the main things that they always ask on uh, when it comes to harvesting for tea and plucking stage is attained when the tea plant is about three to four years this is also an important point on harvesting right and some of the diseases here are blister blight uh, red rust brown blight root rot pest uh, we have a tea mosquito bug thrips leaf eating caterpillars we have jacids we have aphids and mites um so here in this picture uh this is a symptom which i've given on a tea mosquito bug so what they do is that the nymphs are the young ones are the ones that feed on it so they are sucking pests so they would just uh, suck on these uh on the leaves and uh, within two to three hours the a, a small as you can see here a small circular spot care will be formed and after that it'll become more denser and it'll be become more cankler uh, can can and it will turn a reddish brownish color and a canker will start blisters will start and ultimately the whole leaves will curl and it won't be good for consumption or of any use so this is one of the most important pests of um, tea and a question can also come on this as well, right? So try to remember the important, important points on every crop. Our fourth question here is on um, the, the tea plantation requires a rainfall of A, 50 to 100, B, 100 to 200, C, 100 to 150, D, 150 to 250, and E, less than 50. So the right answer for this is... 150 to 200 when you when these type of questions come try to know that like which area they are mostly grown in india as well right so tea is mostly grown in the uh, northeastern states as well as the south indian states so there they are mostly uh, tropical and subtropical and it's a very humid and moist region so in such a way like it can't since it's a moist it needs a more of a humid and moist region so none of these uh, options make sense so the highest of it is 150 to 250 uh, when you try to answer the question try to use more of your logic and more of the understanding and the geographical uh, location or where it's more plant where it's mostly planted so in that way you'll be able to answer the uh, the questions correctly all right so let's just read about it so the ideal climatic conditions for the production and growing of tea are as follows uh, the temperature is about 21 to 29 degrees celsius and about 150 to 200 250 centimeter of rainfall right and northeastern states in india they receive the rainfall of about 150 to 500 centimeter however the distribution is also uneven right but uh, the south indian tea growing areas they can be grown between the 90 to 800 centimeter so tea actually needs a high amount of rainfall okay so coming to our last question uh, uh, sumangla is a variety of which of the following crop uh, a is palmyra b 
uh, is cashew nut, C is areca nut, D is coconut, E is oil palm. So uh, for this question, I would like you all to answer in the comment section, uh, guess or very famous variety actually. So if you guys know out of which out of these plantation crops, which uh, this variety belongs to which of these crops please don't forget to drop by the comment section so that i'll know and i'll be able to know whether you uh you are aware of the varieties as well right well that's all for today uh thank you so much and please don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon and if you've liked the video or if you've enjoyed the session with me please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button as well as share this video with your friends whoever is giving the exam and all the very best for the coming exams and uh, we'll meet for the another session